Hi, folks. Let's talk about what actually occurs when something dissolves. So chemically, what's going on with the molecules? What's going on with the ions when something dissolves in something else? Now, if you have an ionic compound like table salt, and you are putting it in water because you're going to make pasta or you're going to boil potatoes or something like that, chemically, what is occurring to make that dissolving process happen? Well, water, as we have talked about many times this week, is a polar compound, meaning the front end of that water molecule, slightly negative, back end of that water molecule, slightly positive. In an ionic compound, ionic compound is compounds are made of ions. Sodium chloride is made of positive sodium ions, negative chlorine ions, and they are all in a crystalline lattice. What occurs is the water molecules come up next to the outside layer of that crystalline lattice, and the negative parts of the water molecule are going to electrically come next to the positive sodium ions, and the positive parts of those water molecules are going to come next to the negative chlorine ions. Those electrical attractions are going to slowly peel away each individual sodium and chlorine ion and cause them to be hydrated. Hydration means to be surrounded by water. And you're going to end up with those negative ions totally surrounded on 360 degrees on all sides by water molecules and the positive sodium ions surrounded on all sides by water molecules. And so when you have your lovely pot of salt water that you're going to throw your pasta into, these individual negative and positive ions are separated inside of that pot. Now, if you would ever gargle salt water for a sore throat or something, it tastes salty. But the sodiums and the chlorines are separated. How come it tastes salty? Well, it tastes salty because at any moment in time, you are tasting both the sodium and the chlorine ions, and that taste of sodium chloride is coming to your palate. This process of an ionic compound breaking into its ions is called dissociation, and that's a definition you need to know. And chemists write what are referred to as dissociation equations. These are really, really simple. It is sort of reverse crisscrossing from back when we were making ionic bonds many, many weeks earlier. So if we look at sodium chloride, sodium chloride, when it dissociates, it breaks back into ions. It breaks back into that positive sodium ion and that negative chlorine ion. If we write a dissociation equation for potassium carbonate, we have to know what ions potassium and carbonate are going to form. So to review, potassium group one on the periodic table are going to make plus one ion. So this is going to dissociate into positive one ions, and it will be aqueous. And carbonate is a polyatomic, and here's our lovely polyatomic carbonate, and that will dissociate into a negative two ion. So that also will be aqueous. So that is a dissociation equation. It is basically ionic bonding in reverse, taking these ionic compounds, putting them back into their ionic form. You still have all of the pieces that you started with, but you end up with them in ionic form. And we have one more thing that we have to look at, and we have to balance those. We have two potassiums here, so we're going to need two potassiums there. All right, what I'd like to have you do is hit pause and try doing this with potassium bromide. Then we'll go through it together. Now, potassium, group 1, so positive 1, Bromine is a group 17, negative 1 ion. So if we have this solid, we put it in water, it will dissociate into a positive 1 aqueous solution plus bromine, negative 1 aqueous, and we'll end up with 1 bromine, 
one potassium, and we're all good. Okay, hit pause, try copper sulfate, copper sulfate. All right, let's take a look at this. Copper, as you know, is one of those wacky ones. Copper can be copper plus one or copper plus two. So which one is it in this situation? We're going to take our cue from sulfate. Sulfate is, here's my sulfate, SO4 minus two. So sulfate is going to dissociate into SO4 minus two when it is an aqueous solution. And since we have one of each of these ions, copper must be a plus two, also aqueous. And we started with a solid. My bad, I should have had a, sol a solid to begin with. Is it balanced? One copper, one copper, one sulfate, one sulfate. And it's as easy as that. Now, in this dissolving process, if you are dealing with molecular compounds, so these are compounds that are held together by covalent bonds, covalent bonds meaning that they are sharing electrons. This is not a transfer of electrons, but a sharing of electrons. A classic example is sugar, much more complicated molecule than that simple ion transfer, electron transfer you get in an ionic bond. When these sort of covalently bonded compounds dissolve, the molecules are separated out and mixed in amongst the water molecules, but the molecules retain their entire structure. They're separated, but they are not broken apart. Covalently bonded compounds, remember, are made of mostly non-metallic things and hydrogen. Electrolytes. Now, electrolytes are compounds that conduct electric currents when they are in an aqueous solution. Typically, these are going to be ionically bonded compounds. These are good electrolytes. Why? Well, they break into those ions, and ions are going to be positive or negatively charged, and that means that they are going to be great at conducting electricity. Covalently bonded compounds, bad electrolytes. They're not going to conduct electricity well, and those are made of a whole bunch of non-metals, and they are just not going to conduct electricity well because they're going to stay as molecules in solution. You are going to hear the term electrolytes when it refers to fluids that human beings need. The human body needs not only water, but when we perspire, we also perspire off electrolytes. It's kind of gross to even mention, but we've all sweated, I hope. And sometimes if you heavily perspire and perspiration kind of lands on your tongue, it tastes a bit salty. And that's because part of what you're perspiring away are some of these ions, sodium, potassium, magnesium. And if you're going to replace those, you have to also replace the salts because your body has to conduct electric charges in order for neurological impulses to work. That's why a lot of times in a medical situation, patients are not given just plain water. They're given a very weak sodium chloride solution and to help replace those electrolytes. Athletes in hot weather, they're not just sweating away water. They are sweating away those electrolytes. And that's why they, to replenish that, they are taken, taking Gatorade, Powerade, some sort of a sports drink that has those salts in them. Pedialyte, small children, if they get very sick, they, you have to replace not just their fluids, but also replace the salts they have, may have lost. A couple times in my lifetime, I am not a medical person, but I have witnessed dear friends who I've gone camping with great numbers of people, and I've had friends that have come back to camp, and they have been dizzy and delirious and out of sorts and kind of groggy. And these are very, very fit athletes. And people have gone, what's going on? And they've drunk lots and lots and lots and lots of water. But what's happened in very, very hot weather, they're replacing their water, but they have not replaced their electrolytes. Um, my husband's smarter than I, and the first time I observed this happening, he said, hey, this guy is out of electrolytes. And he said, get him some salt water. And we slurried up some salt water made him drink this sitting in the shade, and he was better. And this happened a couple years later with another friend who happened to be an, also an athlete, 
and I observed it again. So this can occur. Um, watch your friends and family because it is something that happens. Now, some compounds are strong electrolytes, some are weak electrolytes. And this is a measurement of how polar the molecules can be. Some polar molecules, now we're talking about covalently bonded compounds, are going to completely break into ions when they are in a water solution. That means that they are a strong electrolyte. Hydrochloric acid is an example. Here is a compound that you put this in a water solution, it is going to break into ions right now. What that means, and we're going to in the future be talking about acids and bases, what that means is that it is going to turn into lots and lots of ions. That means that hydrochloric acid is going to become a very, very strong acid. It likes being ions. You take another covalently bonded compound, and it is not very polar. Um, nitrous acid is one of those, HNO2. Um, nitrous acid is a gas. You mix this with water, and it spends 95% of the molecules in any sample is going to be in the molecular phase, and only about 5% are going to be ions. Why? It's only a little bit polar. Look at this molecule. It's not terribly polar at all. This ends a little bit negative. This ends a little bit positive. It doesn't have that strong polarity of a water molecule. Because of this weak, weak, weak polarity, it also doesn't want to be broken apart into an acid. And so it tends to be a very reversible reaction. You can tell a reversible reaction because the arrows go back and forth like that. They're double arrows. And what that means is the molecule is constantly being broken apart and coming back together and broken apart and coming back together. But it tends to hang out in the molecule side because it's not very polar. It really would prefer to stick together instead of being in bits and pieces. So polarity is important, very important when you start talking about molecules. It is going to help us in the future to determine why some acids and bases are strong, some acids and bases are very, very weak. And this all has to do with solubility. All right, more in the coming weeks. See you later. Bye-bye.